Thank you for the opportunity to be here in this wonderful setting and talk so much about toposes. I've got, this here is a, a presentation of really two quite big recent papers. So in half an hour, I'm not going to be able to do more than just give the, the very basic outline of what I'm doing. But I hope from what I managed to say that you'll see what the, the whole point is. So this is, uh, here's the title, Grotendieck Toposes Constructively Via Arithmetic Universes. And I hope you've got, I hope you've got the idea, those of you who are in the tutorial school, that um, the notion of classifying topos, if you've got a geometric theory, then toposes give you an idea of generalized space of models of the theory, and it's done by the classifying topos. So if you have a th geometric theory T, then uh, from that you can construct a classifying topos, and somehow that is the space of models of the theory T. Now, that's gross and topos is, but the next word is constructively. And you see that uh, that S there is secretly somehow um, ZFC, Z ZF, C sets or something like that, all very classical. And if you want to be constructive, then the, um, it's known, there's technology to say you can replace that S by uh, an elementary topos. Uh, and as long as it's got a natural numbers object, then you can, um, depends, depends how nice T is, but you've, you've got a chance of making a classifying topos for that. So this is now uh, becomes, given your base topos, then you can make the classifying topos with respect to that. So the question there is, well, what base topos do you use? You might say use your favorite base topos, but suppose you haven't got one. Suppose you kind of don't really care. Um, then what is, mathematically, what is the generalized space? So this is where the arithmetic universes come in. I'm, I'm going to show you that for some nicely behaved T at least, there is a single base free calculation. There are single base free calculations that you can do that then uh, are, are going to work for arbitrary S. So it's a way of getting, if you don't care what S is, you can still do the calculations and, and show that uh, your toposes are doing what you think they ought to do. So what I'm going to do is start off with a bridge. So uh, I'm going to write down two geometric theories. And there's a bridge between them. And you may or may not have got sufficient intuition how you, how you build bridges to, to know whether there really is a bridge between them or not. But I'm going to call them, sorry, get my other notes. Uh, so here's the first theory. So this is T1. And it's going to have a, a single sort, which I'll call N. And it's got uh, two function symbols. So one is actually a constant, so that's zero of, uh, of type n. And the other is a unary operator, s, from n to n. And it's going to have axioms. Um, right, first one is that if zero equals s x, then for any x of type n, you have false. And the next one is if x, sx equals sy, then, and this is for any xy of type n, then you have x equals y. And the final one is, uh, with no conditions at all, if x is uh, of type n, then you have this is where it becomes a geometric theory, because there's an infinite d disjunction coming up. I'm going to say, over all possible natural numbers, you have s equals, sorry, uh, yeah, x equals s um, applied n times to zero. So what this means is we've, uh, I mean, this is slightly informal, but there is really, there's an inductively defined countable family of, of uh, equations, and we're taking the disjunction of them. So, okay, um, 
I'm sure you've no idea what this is about. <laughs> uh, and the second theory, T0, is nothing. Right? Nothing at all. <laughs> so, so what I'm claiming is that there is a bridge between these. So there is a geometric morphism from ST1. Sorry, there's, a, there's an equivalence between ST1 and ST0. Uh, let me be careful here. I'm going to... Actually, I'm going to write this up here. So the equivalence... Equivalences have two halves, don't they? So, first of all, we know there's always going to be um, a geometric morphism to S, sets, and you should know that that is the classifier for the empty theory, right? Um, if you don't, homework, right? So this is, this is isomorphic to S, T0. So what we want for our bridge is something going in the opposite direction. So, okay, so here are the basic rules. So this is for, um, to save myself writing geometric morphism all the time, I'm just going to call them maps. Um, in the locality case, they really are just continuous maps. Um, you should think of them as maps in the general case, but anyway, it'll save me blackboard space and it'll save me time in my 30 minutes. So maps from S, T0, that's what we're interested in here, geometric morphism, to ST1. How do you make them? Well, the first thing is you, you hypothesize M, a uh, model of T0, right there. You construct a model of T1, and you do it all geometrically. Now you'll be thinking, hang on Vickers, you weren't at the school, but you all were. You saw the definitions of geometric morphisms, and that wasn't it. Um, but the, the uh, classifying toposes have certain universal properties, and exploiting those universal properties that is, this turns out to be enough. So what's going on? When we hypothesize M, a model of T0, um, what we're really going to use is the generic model that exists in there. When we construct a model of T1, that's going to be working in the same topos. So we get a model of T1 there. And then the definition of classifying topos is what gives us the geometric morphism. And the point of the geometricity is that um, when we, uh, which way am I going? Um, when, we, when we look at the actual points of this, well, actually, I mean, there's, there's not much to say here, but when we look at the actual um, models of T0 in set or where, wherever, then um, the, the generic construction that we've done geometrically will transfer backwards along geometric morphisms. So the, it will, the same construction will also work for all the specific models that we ever want to deal with. All right? So that's all we need to do. So let's apply it to this. We say we hypothesize a model of T0. Well, we don't have to do any, that's nothing. There's nothing there. And from that, out of nothing, we want to construct a model of T1. Now, so that's a model of this stuff. Um, so probably you've been staring at this long enough to at least offer a guess of what might possibly be a model of that. Anyone got any thoughts? No one. <laughs> Come on, you're being shy. Co-product of countably many copies of the Yeah, that's, that's one way of describing it. Co-product of countably many copies of one. Um, so, okay, we can do that. And that's geometric, because co-products are geometric. So we've got our geometric morphism. We haven't quite proved it's an equivalence, 
Uh, one way round is just trivial at this end because there's nothing there. But the other way round, we want to say if we've got an arbitrary model of T1, go down here, come back. So whatever the model was, we've instead got co-products so we've counted many copies of the, of the natural numbers. Are they isomorphic to each other? Well, uh, what, you, what you need to do is, um, is show that if it has these properties, basically you show it's a natural numbers object. And then once you've got that, then you know it's isomorphic to what Ingo said. Okay, so, so this is, this is a, a non-trivial bridge. Uh, and I hope it's going to illuminate what, uh, how to build bridges. But what I'd, I'd like to draw a different message from this. And that is, so starting from nothing and adding this stuff, we haven't changed the classifying topos. So we can put this stuff in for free. It doesn't have any impact on what's going to happen after that. So let me write, down, write this down as a general principle. It's a uh, natural numbers ob object n for free. Um, and in fact, what, what I did for natural numbers objects, you could do, I mean, this isn't actually the, the kind of right way to, to think about it, but you could do the same thing for uh, any, any free algebra construction over essentially algebraic theories. So instead of saying natural numbers object n for free, let's say free algebras. For free. So the principle there is that whenever you're dealing with a geometric theory, you can, you can just assume a construction there that gives you free algebras over stuff that you've already got, and it won't affect the classifying topos that you're making. So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, uh, free, free algebras of, of what? Uh, free algebras. Well, certainly for um, algebraic theories, and actually it works for essentially algebraic theories, the same techniques. So I'll, get, I'll give you an example here, which is sort of illustrates the power of it. I don't need this, do I? So take, let's take um, single sort Q. And, you know, once you've got the free algebras, it turns out you can, you can make the uh, uh, c finite co-limits and things like that. So how do you normally construct the rational? So this sort Q, which is to be rationals, the rationals. So you can, you can get that for free. And then on top of that, so this isn't free. This is changing your uh, classifying topos. You have two predicates. L and R. So I'll, I'll just write that to say that that subspace, subset notation to say that these are predicates on Q. And then axioms are going to be the following. So this double turn style just means go both ways. So uh, if, if Q is in L, then there is some Q primed bigger than Q, uh, and also in Q primes. All right. So going in this direction, that says that L is down closed in the rationals, and going the other direction says it's also rounded. Uh, I'm also going to say it's non-empty, so true entails there exists Q, LQ. Now, I'm going to do the same thing for R, but... Um, for the reverse order. So blah, 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 blah. This becomes bigger than, this becomes R again, and this one becomes R. So I hope you can see, I'm just trying to say it, you've got the same thing the other way around, but symmetric. And what else? If, you, if Q is in both L and R, then false. And finally, uh, if Q is less than R, okay, so th this, this is actually internal, because 
I said you can get the rationals for free. You can get all the arithmetic for free in the order and so on. So if Q is less than R, then, uh, sorry, Q, R in Q, then either Q is in L or R is in R. So I dare say some of you have already seen this as, as one way of defining Dedekind sections. So what this is defining is a theory, geometric theory, whose models are Dedekind sections. So this is basically the geometric theory of the point-free real line. Now, here's, here's something interesting. If you, if you look at what stone spaces, for instance, does, and work that out in terms of geometric theories, you'll find there are infinitary disjunctions, really, that correspond to, to this. So um, this there exists is a kind, could, could be phrased as, as an infinitary disjunction over possible external values of Q primes that, that could fit in. But there are no infinite disjunctions here. It's all coherent logic plus the use of the, the, this free use of, of free algebra constructions. And basically, it's any, any um, constructions that are preserved by inverse image functors. That's what geometric means. So obviously, that means co-limits and finite limits. But uh, I, was, I was trying to persuade you that the free algebras can be expressed using those. And in any case, it's, it's quite easy to see just from the universal properties that they are preserved by the inverse image functors. All right. So this is, this is showing, well, maybe it could be quite useful to not think so much of infinite uh, disjunctions, where there's a problem, which is where do the infinities come from, but just think of coherent logic and the ability to introduce nice things that you thought you were going to have anyway in your, in your mathematics. Okay, so that's... Uh, So from now on, I'm going to be interested in theories T that can be expressed in this way. Coherent logic, free algebra constructions. So we're, so we're thinking of T with coherent plus these things. So that's nice. That can be, uh, you can get nice tricks out of this. But there's, there's something funny going on. And this comes from what I said earlier, that S, when I wrote down S for classifying toposes, that need not be sets. So I said something about that in the introduction. So S need not be set. So for these things, for these theories, all you need for S, and this comes from a, a paper by Johnston and Wraith, uh, I think that's right, um, all you need is for S to have an NNO. And in fact, you can't get far without it because uh, that's, uh, you don't get many theories that, uh, you can't build many classifying toposes without having an NNO anyway. So from now on, I'm going to assume that S at least has an NNO. But um, that means when, you, when you've got a nice theory like that, so all its infinities uh, can be expressed within S, then you find, um, you find that there's a big question of which S do you actually want to use. So the classifying topos is, say, you've got pick your S, then you can make your ST, and it's got a generic model in it. Let's call it G. And then the classifying topos property says, if you, you'll see why I'm writing, writing it like this in a moment. If you've got any topos over S, so let's call it E. So here we've got a geometric morphism P, and here's Q. Um, if we've got a model of T in E, so let's call that M, the classifying topos property says there is some, I'll write it F with, a, um, with an overbar. The reason for that is I'm going to write the underbars for the things that are down at this level later, this 
don't see it yet. There is some f over bar such that this m is going to be isomorphic to f over bar star, the inverse image functor applied to the generic model, which is g. So that's the, the greater part of the classifying topos property, but we have to be careful about two cells as well. So two cells, say, if you've got homomorphisms of models here, they correspond to two cells there. So everything actually, I'm going to kind of talk to you as though these are the one categories, but the two categorical issues are really important and uh, not so trivial to overcome. Okay. We also have to be about E, right? Ah, you think of boundedness? Yeah, so, yeah, it, yes, this will come in. These, uh, that P is anyway, and I'm assuming that Q is a bounded geometric morphism, but I'm also interested in unbounded geometric morphisms down at the bottom layer, which is sort of an interesting subtlety. Um, okay, so, so if we, if we want to, to, to think, you know, what is the mathematical object that represents the generalized space, this is actually a bit scary because the, ge the generalized space is somehow this assignment S maps to S, the, the classifying topos. So, you know, you might not have a favorite S that you want to, to uh, restrict yourself to anyway, but uh, it turns out that, um, well, this is this. Yeah, I won't go into this, but it comes down to the two-cell level again. Once you've picked S, it's sort of um, restricted the two cells where you might be interested in, in knowing about them more generally. Anyway, so this means it's, it's all kind of indexed over uh, a big category where the S's are going to live, so category of elementary toposes and geometric morphisms. So uh, conceptually, you might think it's indexed categories, but I, I have to say... Index two categories, to me, are a nightmare of coherence properties that I would not want to try and even attempt to, to get around. So to make it easy for myself, I couldn't use index ca two categories. I used fibred two categories, which, um, which might sound, some people think that's even scarier, but I, I don't think it was in this case. <laughs> so, okay, so what, what we've got for the... Um, what we're going to have is a number of uh, two categories. In fact, we're going to have three of them fibered over each other. So uh, they're, going to be, they're going to be like this. So, so the bottom layer, we've just got elementary toposes. One layer up, we've got these bounded geometric morphisms. And then a further layer up, we've got bounded geometric morphism from E with a model of T. T is fixed here. Model of model M of T. And uh, so we might have another one like this, M primed. And then the morphisms are going to, here's Q primed. Morphisms are going to be, what they call this G. Arbitrary geometric morphisms there. Uh, arbitrary geometric morphisms here. Uh, isomorphism in, in this thing. Um, and then for, for this, we've got a homomorphism of models from M primed to G upper. I have to be a bit careful about how I define that, but yeah, G, G upper star of, um, of the M. Uh, two cells down here, well, they all have to have paced together properly, but two cells, I'm going to assist their isomorphisms at at this level, but they can be arbitrary two cells up here, and, uh, and then the two cells up here are just, um, you've got a two cell here, and there's an appropriate commutative square that you have to check up there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and ensure that you understand the two cells. I'm, I'm going to work at the one cell level. Um, okay, so now we've now got three, two categories, and projections all the way down, and they all turn out to be five, two, two categorical vibrations, except 
actually they're not they're bicategorical vibrations between these two categories so this is based on Buckley's account so the uh, lifting the uh, getting a Cartesian lifting given the the G underbar then to to lift it up here you just take the by pullback uh, and the Cartesian one cells are going to just be by pullbacks and then the Cartesian one cells for this layer are going to be where that's an isomorphism, so obvious lift is just to take equalities. Um, and uh, so in terms of those, uh, you know, I, I've got some, some properties that say what it means to, um, you know, have, a, uh, have one of these things serving as a classifying topos. So given S, find a classifier for T, and then find a, a generic model in it. And uh, to take account of the change of base, I also needed a, a, a property that if, if you had one of these being a classifying topos, then if you just take a, a Cartesian for the, for the whole thing, which means you've got bipull back there and isomorphism up there, then uh, what you get is also going to be a classifier for over S primed instead of over S. So that's the, uh, the way that the coherence is less, less, less difficult and it, it comes out more nicely in, in the vibration. So, so what this means is that uh, to, to say that T has classifiers everywhere is, is to say that you've got a whole, you know, whole family of stuff. So that does not sound really like uh, um, a kind of nice handy piece of data that you can, that you can just use. So this, this is where the arithmetic universe is coming. Um, I think I can rub these out. So just briefly, um, the arithmetic universes are an attempt to get uh, a pure logic, um, pure, pure coherent logic, plus the uh, the free algebras. So this this is kind of arithmetic fragments of geometric. Now, although it's a whoops, although it's a fragment, it's not. It still can do some serious stuff because I've shown it can do the the real line. You can get lots of topology, algebraic series. It's obviously got arithmetic in it. So, you know, big questions. Well, maybe it's really useful. Maybe it can even do the kind of things that Grotten invented topos is for. To to prove that would take a huge amount of work, right? So that's still in the future, but it, it is something we can dream about. So that, that's kind of my hope, that just in themselves, these are already doing what we'd like to be able to do with, well, what we know we can do with Grotten Deep Toposes. Um, so, um, so categorically, these come down to arithmetic universes. I'll just write AUs, which are uh, pre-toposes, toposes plus uh, parameterized list objects. So I think, where's Millie? I think you actually first homed in on this particular definition, I think, didn't you? Yeah, there's sort of various conjectures what a good definition was before. The, um, Dwyer invented them in the first place. Um, Was that me? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was the dog. So the, so the first task here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. So the first task here is, is to formalize what, what this really means. So I actually, uh, I actually formalized it using uh, a development of, 
of sketches. Okay, so it, it was using sketches to formalize. In, in the pre-toposes, you've got a finite limit, so you can do those in sketches. Uh, what you have in pre-topos is in combination with the list objects gives you arbitrary <laughs> finite co-limits, so we can sketch those easily enough and then sketch the uh, parameterized list objects. Okay, so th the, the sketches that I'm using are constrained in such a way that for every uh, non-strict model, there's a, a canonical strict isomorph, and that's really useful to, to be able to use, and it, it gives a good way of, uh, of capturing the, the interface between the, the syntax and the semantics. Pre-topos, uh, finite limits, um, I can't remember the right word. So, so you have um, fi finite co-products which, uh, which, which are disjoint and stable. Um, you've got co-equal... Where am I? Okay, right. Um, so ha having got that, so th this, um, so these are now, the, the geometric, morphic, geometric theories have now turned into certain sketches. So first of all, um, need to prove each T does give classifying toposes. For, uh, for every S with NNO, elementary topos with NNO. And um, I, I was really following the definition of classifying topos that you see in the elephant, which doesn't look like geometric theories at all, but um, this fitted quite nicely into, into that. And then show that you get, show the, the, um, show the geometricity basically which is, I've rubbed out the diagram, but I wanted to show that if I started with a classifier over S and then pulled it all back, then I'd still have a, a classifier over S, S prime. So that's the geometricity. So, um, actually, that's, that's, that's a baby theorem, and there's a, uh, there's, there's a slightly bigger theorem for when you, you've not just got a single sketch, but you've got one sketch and another one that extends it. And um, the aha, I've known how to right. And the the bigger theorem is what is underlying Cena's work, which he's going to talk about next. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs>